I am honored today to have two very special people with me and uh, just to shake your hand last night, which is the first time I've ever seen you, mm -hmm. uh, just the idea that I'm shaking somebody's hand that walked in a place that is very dear to me. Mm. And that is the place where Moses was in the wilderness. That is very special. The story of Moses has always been very special to me. And I have found, according to the Bible, that there are some places that are given reference to that this is where, um, you know, Sinai was mm -hmm. and, and so forth, and the Mount and, and so forth. But I have always felt, according to the Bible, it's not the place where it is mm -hmm. uh, known to be in the, uh, which would be peninsula in Egypt, but it is mm -hmm. rather across and over uh, on the other side of the Red Sea. And you were in, working the oil fields uh, about how many years ago? I was working uh, in uh, Arabia in the eastern province. Okay. I was working for a company called Aramco. Mm -hmm. uh, we arrived there in 1988, mm -hmm. and um, within about uh, two and a half years, we, we had established ourselves. We were doing a lot of camping. We did a lot of desert running. You know, we uh, equipped ourselves in our vehicle to be able to go out in the desert. And um, we found that there was a tremendous amount of history there. Anywhere you just dig your hand in the sand and you come up with something. Mm -hmm. Roman glass, Very bronze true. artifacts. It, it was an amazing, amazing place. And um, through a series of events, we ended up at, uh, in the northwestern province of Arabia. And this is just to make a long story very mm -hmm. short, but we ended up coming to the base of a mountain called Jebel Al Laws. Mm -hmm. And come to find out, we didn't really know at the time that there was a controversy about, you know, right. Mount Sinai in Egypt mm -hmm. and the Sinai Peninsula, that it was uh, possibly not the mountain. But when we came into this area, there is a, um, it's a very special place. And it matches, what the Bible says about the character of Mount Sinai, absolutely perfectly. Everything was there. And, you know, we, we talk about uh, the golden calf altar. We talk about this um, sacrificial altar where Moses actually brought oxen up for sacrifice. Elijah's cave, you can see it from the valley floor. It's that huge. I mean, there's so many things there that just match the Bible in its description of what's there perfectly. So. And you know, we, we were, uh, the very first time that we set ourselves to go to Mount Sinai, we really, as he said, didn't have any idea that there was a controversy. We aimed our truck directly at um, the traditional Mount Sinai, at the base of the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt, mm -hmm. went there and didn't see any of these things that he just spoke of mm -hmm. as being at this mountain called Jebel al Laws in Saudi Arabia. Therefore, we were very disappointed. And after doing quite a bit of research, we found out that <clears throat> quite a number of archaeologists, um, even as far back as into the 1930s, were deciding that there was not physical evidence there at the traditional location in the Sinai Peninsula of Egypt. So there has been, there's been a controversy about that site that has raged for years because no one has ever found true evidence that a large number of people traversed that traditional area or came to that traditional mountain. Uh, whereas when you move over and you begin to look at the site in Saudi Arabia, everything changes. Mm -hmm. There's a vast amount of potential evidence there as opposed to the site that's traditional. And it's amazing that it seems that uh, God had something in mind when you went to Saudi Arabia, not even knowing what you're going to be uncovering for, not only for uh, your own interests, but for the world to see. And there is, this is a mountain that has basically been off premises. Uh, not a lot of people been there, not really been that discovered. Uh, only a handful, only, only a, a handful few people. people. Uh, going back to the mid 1800s, uh, people started to question the traditional location. Hmm. And they were going there with their Bible open and looking at what they saw up at the mountain and how the distance from the valley floor to the top was so close they could see Moses on top. There wasn't enough room in the valley below the mountaintop to, for the people. Right. Like I say, about 10,000 
people tents at the most. Mm -hmm. And we're talking supposedly millions in yeah. this valley. Yeah. So there was, there was questions that were being raised and so they started looking elsewhere. What were the possibilities? Mm -hmm. And this location in Arabia became one of the candidates, you know, to look. And there was a gentleman named Charles Beck. This is 1878 in that era, was uh, searching for the mountain. He had gone, he was a doctor, he had retired his practice. He was at, he went to the Mount Sinai, I felt a calling to go there was horribly disappointed, similar to the way we were. We didn't know any of this. This is just things that we've learned since. And Charles was uh, compelled to search and spend his fortune searching for Mount Sinai, and he was looking in Saudi Arabia. Now, his theory was a volcano, so he was looking for a volcano itself, but he ends up right on the shore of Makna, which is just about 15 miles to the due west of the mountain. He was sick, he was ill at the time, he sent an expedition and they came right into the lost region. Mm -hmm. And be he believed, he never made it in there personally, but he believed that he had found the mountain. And, uh, and, and he has a thing that he had written in his book, he said, and time will prove me right that Mount Sinai is in Arabia and we're, we're wow. testifying that he's right. Yeah, um, we quote him quite often on not. that because yeah. hopefully uh, time will prove all of us who yeah, believe us this right. correct, um, it, uh, to know, I guess I would say that it gave us great um, hope to continue looking for things and eventually throughout all of the Arabian Peninsula um, because as things continue to turn up, the story, uh, the plot thickens, mm -hmm. so to speak, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. more as more and more evidence yeah. is revealed. But when we first got to Arabia, um, we, uh, there wasn't a lot to do. We were on an American compound, and of course they had swimming pools and tennis courts and all of that kind of stuff within the compound, but that's not generally the kind of thing that he and I have been involved with. I mean, I mean from, yeah. No, yeah. From, from the very beginning, yeah. Yeah. you know, it, we yeah. are outdoorsy kind of people. Right. Yeah. But um, we started uh, probably to placate me because I was quite unhappy when I first got to uh, Saudi Arabia. I did not want to leave my, my little her. home. <laughs> <laughs> Entertain. But yeah. um, he found out that, that, you know, you could go out and you have a four-wheel drive vehicle. Mm -hmm. And um, the one beauty of Arabia is that there are vast, unfenced areas of desert. And by and large, if you're not going near a military installation or something of that nature, you're free to roam those territories. It's not, uh, every ounce of land is not owned by someone as it sort of is yeah, here in this yeah, country. Yeah. Uh, so you have a, uh, just a vast frontier laid out before you. And as he said, when we first began to make these little jaunts out, we lived in the eastern province. So we, did, we didn't live anywhere near where the mountain is in the northwestern province. It's quite a long way away. But we began to go out and do these little overnight desert trips in our area. And actually, unbeknownst to us at the time, we thought we were just, you know, entertaining ourselves. Yeah, yeah. But it's sort of like those things that God prepares you for, mm -hmm. even when you don't realize he's preparing you for something. You're doing something you think this is just right. something that we want to do. Yeah. And yet in the long run, as we look back on it, we can see we were being trained very carefully, methodically. Mm -hmm. How do you camp in the desert? What must you bring to survive in the desert? If your truck breaks down, you must have backups for this. If you run out of food, you must have backups for this. You know, and, and and so by the time three or four years goes by and we begin and get started into these jaunts to Mount Sinai or to Jebel Al Laws in the Northwest, we had a real good understanding of what would it take for us to be able to camp with a backpack on our back for four or five days, sometimes even up to seven days at a time, we would enter into these regions and get out of the vehicle as quickly as we could and run up into the rocks and you know halfway up the mountain so that we wouldn't be apprehended and sent back out of the region. Um, and unbeknownst to us, we had been prepared for that for the first few years we were in Arabia. And the reason they would not want you in those places was off premises or against the law or, well, or what? Uh Curiosity, uh, they don't like you around, sort of or all Americans, of, or? Sort of uh, all, maybe of, the all of the above. Yeah, maybe all of the yeah. above. Mm -hmm. in, in a certain way, 
I, I definitely want to say this because of their, if you want to call it suspicion, mm -hmm. if you want to call it protectiveness, mm -hmm. because of their keeping people away, they have done us an enormous service in preservation. Mm -hmm. The areas are pristine, other than the occasional Bedouin that runs through with his flocks. Mm -hmm. I mean, to be perfectly honest, this is a greatly remote area in the desert. Um, it's 50 kilometers to the nearest blacktop road, asphalt oh, road. Well, so at we're least way it was out at the middle. time. Yeah. Uh, even even to the main the road going into uh, Al, uh, Al, Al, Ula. Al Ula. But uh, even where Al Khan is located, that's mm -hmm. all dirt road territory back in there. So it's incredibly remote. Yeah. I mean, Do if you, you picked a point, this would be the you know, most remote mm -hmm. place to get to. Do you think they know what they have in there? Yes. Well, let's say this. I think they do. Yeah, I think they do. And, and the, the Department of Antiquities since the early 80s was, was they were going through the kingdom. And, and with this, what exactly, mm -hmm. idea to protect their heritage yes. or any of the ancient ruins that they had, they would put archaeological fences around it. They were all identical. They had a certain look about them. They were 10 feet high with three strands of barbed wire on top. They had a blue sign, and it was the, from the Department of Antiquities mm -hmm. out front. It's one of the things we recognized immediately going into the area, that they had been there, and they knew what they had. Well, we don't know specifically they knew everything mm -hmm. about the site, because there was no excavation uh, done at the time mm -hmm. in 1991. Uh, so, we're going in there, and, and those are keys that, we, that were triggers that we knew something was there mm -hmm. and that they were aware of it. Mm -hmm. Now, normally they have guard, uh, what we call a, uh, a guard building. There's three windows on it. You see it's the same building you see all over Kingdom. Um, at times they have been manned, you know, with, with uh, frontier forces, with their machine guns. Um, first time we were in there, they weren't in the building at the time. We were escorted into one of the sites. Bedouin gatekeeper opened it up for us, okay. took us back in Walk there. Right in. <laughs> we walked in, escorted. You know, what yeah. I mean, uh, the uh, the older man left his son with us. We actually went back to where the altar is and the pillars. We were able to look at Elijah's cave. See, we didn't climb up there about a four thousand foot climb to get up to that ele elevation, but we saw a lot of things. Mm -hmm. When we, by the time we got back to the gate, two hours went by, maybe three hours. Something like that, yeah. Uh, the, the, the Bedouin that had let us in, the gatekeeper, had um, gone out and, and talked to the frontier forces. Yeah. They arrived, yeah. and when they came, okay. everything changed. Yes, they they showed up with their weapons, drew their weapons on us. Um, basically pushed me around, wanted to know, my, see my paperwork, which I pulled out. It had travel letter that brought us through the area, mm -hmm. the Jebel Laws Range. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we, we had legal permission to kind of be there, and I'm explaining that we were let in by these folks, you know, I mean, it was uh, okay for us, supposedly, okay. But it wasn't. They left nothing uh, to my imagination in the way of we were not in the right place. We needed to leave immediately. And I, and I was complaining. I was telling the guy. I said, it was almost dark. And I said, I did not know how to get out of there uh, safely. I said, we needed to camp in the vicinity somewhere, uh, which we were capable of doing. They insisted that we go to Tabuk, mm -hmm. which meant I had to drive out of the desert at night. Very difficult to do. Because every little, you're looking at the Bedouin track, you don't know which one to take, you take the wrong one, you're in a, you're in a box canyon. You can't get out. Mm -hmm. And in fact, where we were, we were in a box canyon. Um, but we managed, so they made their point. And, and we got in the truck and we left. And, um, and we managed to find our way back to Tabuk that evening, about 2 o'clock in the morning. At 2 o'clock in the morning. Had yeah. a flat tire. Had a flat day. tire on the road. I carried, what? speaking of that, you know, in traveling, I carried two batteries. I had two spare tire, two spare tires, one strapped on top of my truck, 30-gallon water tank. I had all, all rubber components, spares. I had spare belts, spare water pump, everything that could break. You know, casually, other than a, a tie rod or something like that, we had on we had on board with us, so we were able to change the tire and keep going. Wow. But but you know, I'll yeah. tell you something about that. That sounds like a great deal of preparation and sort of agony to have to go through to you know to just go out and spend a few hours at this place. But there, 
and I'll be speaking from our personal experience here, but there is something so dramatically holy hmm. about the site. I remember the very first time, that first time he's describing where we were let in and we walked into the area. With this young Bedouin boy. It, hmm. it yeah. shook us hard enough yes. where oh, I, I, know, I looked I, I at him. thinking about oh, this yeah. experience yeah. Yeah. right now. Yeah. Down he went. Right on the I ground. I fell on my face. And, and down I'm sure I went. this young bedroom right. boy didn't have a clue <laughs> didn't know what, what was going, going on. <laughs> he, didn't. <laughs> he didn't know. Wow. But no. that was, it was really mm. that perception and, and witness mm -hmm. that realizing where you were made us continue. What there. Because uh, the technical aspects of it, the logistical aspects of it, and the danger aspects of it were not conducive to wanting to return. <laughs> Ever. You know, it, it had to be a I mean, heartfelt thing. They made it clear, thing. never yeah. come back. Yeah, it had to be a heartfelt thing. And, yeah. you know, that was the first time, three weeks later, about three and a half weeks later, we were back in the same spot <laughs> and had the same trouble. Yeah. <laughs> but, well, but I you know. changed things. We yeah. rented a vehicle, so we weren't <laughs> okay. in the same truck. I cut my hair. I had a flat top okay. instead of long hair. Uh -huh. um, we did. Yeah. We, <laughs> we tried to change <laughs> the way Didn't we Didn't matter we, a bit. Yeah. They knew oh, us. They were on us. They arrested us. Yeah, they arrested us immediately. But Short this, woman, tall man. And, and can I tell a little, just a little quick story? Sure. So the first time, this first trip coming in, um, we were lost, and we, we were probably 20, 30 kilometers away from the mountain. And I knew we were heading in the right direction, but a, I saw a vehicle coming uh, to cross the path. It was an uh, you know, intersection up ahead, desert. Now we're talking just dirt tracks. And I knew he was going to cross my path in front of me, and he did, and he stopped about 20 to 30 yards, and then I pulled up and I stopped. So I got out, and it was a Bedouin, a Bedouin that was, uh, he got out of his vehicle, and then I'm walking up, and salam alaikum, gave him my best greetings in the few 50, 30, you know, 30, 50 you words of Arabic. Here? Somewhat, you know, okay. I mean, I could do the greetings, because I mean, I worked with Saudis every mm -hmm. day. Now, they wanted to speak English in the company, because oh, okay. uh, that's the oh, okay. language of the company. Mm -hmm. But I learned as much Arabic as I could. So, mm -hmm. uh, after the greetings and, and the friendly face, we, we started kind of getting the business, where are we going? Mm -hmm. And I kept saying, I'm looking for this Jebel Laws. Mm -hmm. Lose, he says, lose. I said, yes, Jebel Lose. And so he, in the sand, he drew the direction. Mm -hmm. I was going in the right direction, but he said, turn here and then continue on. Mm -hmm. So I waited for him to follow me, and he, he came within about 10 or 15 feet of the truck. He didn't get close because he knew my family was in the vehicle, and, and they wouldn't come up to the truck. But uh, I reached in on my dash. I had a big can of uh, honey-roasted cashews. Oh. Now, they love nuts, uh, and they love this sweet nuts. Right, yeah. So, yeah. so I turned around, and I walked over to him, and I said, you, you know, thank you. It was your shukran, you know, and, and your information at Mumtaz was excellent. And, uh, and I'm saying, you know, take this gift. Well, he refused, but he did. He did eventually take it, turned around, and we said our goodbyes, and he went off. So then we have this encounter with the Frontier Forces mm -hmm. later that day. Okay, so we get in there, and then that's when we have to go back to Tabuk on our own. Three weeks later, like mm -hmm. she's saying, we went into the same area. I mean, we are, it was all over me that we had to document this because we hadn't taken hardly any pictures, only of the golden calf altar. And even up to now, you were never really aware of what was in there. Uh, I mean, uh, prior to this, no, almost no. nothing. You almost were just nothing. Kind of exploring, and we, we were of, we were yeah we were basing this on on the idea that Charles Beck, uh, okay. remember what I said yeah, earlier, yes. okay. uh, had had targeted Arabia in this region, okay. and then there was another book by Emmanuel Lanati called The Mountain of God, mm -hmm. right, the, where he describes Jebel Laws as being one of the candidates. This was okay. mid '80s, 1980s. So you had that information. We had that information, we had that information. and when we had the the, the maps, the NOAA yeah. maps, mm -hmm. and the uh, Al Farsi maps that mm -hmm. we used for travel. <laughs> so so three weeks later, we're back in there, and now we pull into a site to camp where we knew we were within, I was within um, maybe 300 yards of where the pillars were, where the mm -hmm. covenant site, if we want to call it mm -hmm. that, the covenant site. So I knew I'd be able to wake up early in the morning before light and go over there and maybe get some pictures. That was the plan. Mm -hmm. So we pulled up in camp. Well, sure enough, we're spotted. 
And we actually set up camp and everything was going fine until after dark, a truck comes up out of nowhere and flies right up like our tent is here within inches of our tent like he's going to run us over and I mean screeching on the brakes and there the, the headlights right in our tent and I'm popped up like this I know you could you know probably see through the material that some people were in there and it was a, a, a tactic to just scare us intimidate us so he backed off and I'm Man, that was close. And a couple minutes later, here he comes again, screeching up, headlights in the tent, and then he disappeared. Well, the next day, um, a truck comes up, and a Bedouin gets out, and uh, he's got a shotgun. And we go into this argument about, you know, these whether we can be there or not. And I remember you got out of the, you came up, it made and, matters much worse. And just went into a rage, I guess you'd say. And she had, I mean, you had the airplane tickets or something there. And then she starts hollering and swatting at the guy with her tickets. Now, you don't, slip, and the women don't usually mm -hmm. <laughs> confront the Bedouin. It kind of took him by surprise. But his son gets out. They, they, you know, have their weapons. And they promptly arrest us. Mm. All right. So the next thing is we're following this guy. To some place out in the middle of the desert, and ends up being a front no, frontier for okay. He's he's a uh, he's a local Bedouin with weapons. That's all it okay. took for me. You know, he's taking us back to this mm -hmm. frontier forces outpost. So we're uh, we're Lucas and I had to get out of the truck. Penny and Chelsea stayed in the vehicle, follow this guy into this block building, tin shanty of an outpost, right? And we're, there's three or four Bedouin in there, and they're hollering and screaming. They got my paperwork, and they make us sit down on this dirt floor, and in the middle there's a fire going. They got an old, uh, mm -hmm. old teapot, teapot sitting there yeah. Yeah, with the, with the <laughs> fuzz, uh, the moss sticking out the end of it. You know, yep. I don't know if I have to drink some of this nasty <laughs> yeah. stuff, probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they're passing my agama around, which is a passport to be in mm -hmm. kingdom with my travel letter, to be at Jebel Laws. Um, and they're shouting going back and forth. And probably 30 minutes go by, maybe 40 minutes go by. It seemed like an eternity. Um, I hear some noise coming from another part of the building and some doors slamming. And one of them comes in and he grabs me and he pulls me up and, and he brings me in there and there's a, a door that's open, a desk, and a guy that's sitting there turned around, An official mm -hmm. full bore colonel's type mm -hmm. looking outfit. And he's digging on the floor for something. There was paper piled up, no filing cabinet. It was just like it was thrown. They had made, they had took a piece of paper, this was amazing to me, and drawn a copy of my travel letter on, by hand during this time. It looked like, that was their copy. It looked exactly, the guy did a magnificent, it looked like an art. It looked like a piece of art. And then he had comp copied my gama as well on this piece of paper. And they, that was shoved on the desk, and uh, as well as my gama. So I'm standing there just bracing myself, and the guy turns around, and it's the Bedouin that I had given oh. the cashews to. Oh, my. <laughs> and he recognized you. Oh, immediately. Oh, oh immediately. <laughs> and he's oh. the chief of police. He's the chief oh. of police. <laughs> So oh, that, that was, that uh, was oh, just a God is thing. A God <laughs> thing or what? Oh, yeah. my. Oh my! Uh, yeah, and and so immediately wow. the screaming began. He started shouting at the people yeah. and telling them to, to get get my son. And, Let us you know, go. You know? We we oh. talked for a few minutes. Oh, that, that is that <laughs> is so and, beautiful. And look, we went right back to the place where yeah. we camped. Now, what he did tell me, wow. I have to I have to say that he said it's forbidden to go behind the fences. But uh, he said, you're welcome to camp but and don't be take with pictures. your family and don't take yeah, pictures. Don't take pictures, don't so, go behind yeah. the fence. But yeah. he so, released. Well, he anyway, released we them. were able to go right back into the area. And in subsequent trips oh, later, I remember we've been there. This, this was trouble. And, and if the other uh, frontier forces that had been out there, and, it's, and we can go into the west side, which is even a whole different group of people, very, very aggressive, very... Uh, one of the most difficult times I had was on the west side where the split rock is. Okay. But on this side, we had some leniency, mm -hmm. somewhat. 
Still not to go behind the fences, but uh, we had favor. So the, the, the Saudis themselves, they could get in, into these places, or is it off premises for them as no, well? No, 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 the Bedouin are, are in free to roam anywhere in these anywhere. areas. In yeah. fact, there's one of them that holds the keys to that gate in the local area. Right, and he's the one that you let know, us in the first, and, very first time. And, and yeah. honestly, the, uh, the Bedouin themselves in that area, uh, they know. They call this the Allah Mount. They mm -hmm. call this the the Mountain of God, mm -hmm. or they call it the Moses Mount, mm -hmm. Jebel Musa. Um, from local tradition, you know, mm -hmm. from generations, generations, years, to generations to generations, generations, we find it a little bit fascinating that that these particular tribes have been in that area, and they themselves were not the ones primarily that caused us trouble. It, to be honest, I believe they were under a certain edict from that local frontier okay. forces. Mm -hmm. If you see anyone that's coming into these places, you better okay. report it to us mm -hmm. or you're going to be in trouble. Uh, I kind of think that's how it would yeah, work because there were several how, how levels was. of authority, it seemed, mm -hmm. in those areas. Mm -hmm. But as I said, because they have been so tight about these things, what's actually out there on the ground is pristine. And uh, as frustrating as that is, because it, it would be, it is our greatest prayer mm -hmm. that they will be moved upon mm -hmm. to eventually open these areas such that uh, peoples of all faith can witness the Amen. fact of what great mm -hmm. things they have there that, uh, you know, uh, Daniel says that it is our God who puts leaders in and takes leaders yeah. out. And obviously, they are in control of these areas, for this point in time at least, for a reason. Mm -hmm. If not the least of which, to have protected them and preserved right. them all right. this time. So, right. uh, like I said, mm -hmm. as frustrating as that is, we can thank them for keeping well, these things yeah. off, gar yeah. uh, uh, off limits. I have, uh, uh, what we want to talk about next is we want to get more details about some of the things you've found as well as Horup and, uh, mm -hmm. and Sinai and so forth and the different, the different things that you found in that area, mm -hmm. the corral, things of this mm -hmm. nature yeah. and, and yeah. stuff like that. Uh, but one thing that I've, that I've believed uh, and I've, I've spoken about it many times and, uh, and that is that I, I believe and in my personal experience is God turns my head where he wants my feet and I believe that goes as far as the whole uh, in the end times from a Christian perspective and everything that God obviously turned your face in that area and mm -hmm. took you to those mountains well, did. because mm -hmm. there's some yeah. feet that are that are needing to go there mm -hmm. and perhaps at this end time and we're living in a very 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 last moment right Absolutely. now and and things are developing and and what's so amazing on my part is to sit here with you mm. uh, Jim and Penny Caldwell from Mississippi uh, to the places where God led you and brought you and, and took you and used you and uh, in a way that looked like a complete other thing. It looked like we're going to go to the oil fields and mm -hmm. what you found in the oil fields was a different type of oil that I believe that you really recognized when you, when you left. You came back with oil that is a tremendous ministry to us to know that the scripture is true, and I've, I've been noticing that in, in watching some of your literature and so forth, and even as you've been with us, to the technicalities that are in the Bible, that there's a reason for it all, and it's true, and you found those things to be just what they are. Exactly. The evidences. You know, the, um, when we just literally, as opposed to what I remembered, perhaps from a child, in what the storyline is, mm -hmm. Sometimes when you go back and you just put the scripture in front of you and you actually read what it says, mm -hmm. you have a, a, maybe a different yes. view than, uh, you know, I, I think sometimes when you're a child, and this is right and proper, mm -hmm. you teach the moral lesson that yeah. is associated mm -hmm. with the story. And that's right. Uh, sure. You know, this is what it, you, you should right. be taught these mm -hmm. things. but. Um, our God is multidimensional yeah. in, you know, and as Very you come so. to adulthood, yeah. you realize there's so much, this goes so much deeper. Mm -hmm. There are so many more things we need to glean yes. from this than the mm -hmm. obvious moral lesson, which again, I said, as I say, is a very proper thing to do. But yeah. um, 
when you get into exactly what the scripture says, uh, and we bring this out a great deal in our presentations, um, there are clues even in scriptures like uh, Galatians 4.25 when it talks about this is, uh, Sinai is in Arabia. Um, there are clues in these things that are fascinating to us. Um, one of the ones that we spoke of last night mm -hmm. uh, was when Moses got up, it says he got up, um, he built an altar and 12 pillars. A great deal of assumption has taken place. And I, I have to say, I, you know, had assumed some, somewhat of the same thing, that perhaps in a desert region like that, perhaps Moses would take pillars uh, or would take stones and turn them up as pillars. And that's what he, he just picked, uh, you know, random rocks there. And he used one of each of the random rocks to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. That was not a, a hard stretch for me to believe. In yeah. fact, that's what I thought at first until I went to this site. Okay, let's talk about these pillars, mm -hmm. okay. and uh, let's do some conversation on that. Mm -hmm. uh, well, can I say can I yeah. say this about about the, there was a uh, when I initially read the scripture uh, in chapter twenty four when Moses wakes up early in the morning, and then he builds an altar at the base of the mountain and he erects twelve pillars, and and there was a thought in my mind is how could he have done that in one day? There had to be some preparatory work, but the scripture is pretty clear. It happens in one day. Mm -hmm. Until I got to the scripture that talks about the erection of the tabernacle itself. Mm -hmm. We know that the tabernacle was uh, a series of building of the Ark of the Covenant, building of the uh, menorah. All of these things were constructed over time. And then there's one ceremonial day where it says specifically the exact same wording that you see in chapter 24 that Moses woke up early in the morning and assembled the tabernacle. So then that makes this possible where they could have taken time to erect the altar. Well, actually it's the corral. The altar is an earthen altar. And then have the, they had the resources, they had the manpower. They were just out of Egypt having built these monuments of Egypt to be able to quarry the material for the foundation stones and the pillars themselves. So I just wanted to make that point that uh, right off the bat, you, you look at it and, and it raises questions in your mind until you see it in that, mm -hmm. you know. And if you've been word. to Egypt and saw what, what, they, what they did, I mean, yeah, this, this, is, is, this is no issue. Uh, yeah, it's no issue. I could see an argument perhaps if you've never seen some of the things that are in Egypt, the detail, mm -hmm. and how they could do things really fast. But the experts, basically, the way I see it, the experts mm -hmm. left Egypt. Yes, yeah. they did. The, the talent with yeah. them. And they were and master, and master, master, master stone craft. masons, yeah. master craftsmen. But the other thing is, back we are to that extreme precision of scripture. Mm -hmm. It says Moses built an altar and twelve pillars. Mm -hmm. We have another portion of scripture that that talks about Jacob after the death of Rachel, his wife. Mm -hmm. It says he turned up a stone as a pillar to mark Rachel's grave. Mm -hmm. That is mm -hmm. very highly specific. There has been an assumption that Moses turned up stones as pillars, but that's actually not what the scripture says mm -hmm. right there. And because of the fact that we have another instance where that was done, we believe that the scripture would have said so mm -hmm. if Moses just took various stones of the area, uh, area and stood them right. up as pillars. But that's not the construction of the mm -hmm. words there. And what you see at the site, yeah fits what the scripture says about the And so what you see is the rounded pillars, and they're not necessarily uh, this high or uh, 10 feet high, but you right. find them in, in every different... Uh, no two are uh, the yeah, same height. Yeah, and exactly. I noticed that what you said last night in that, that was yeah. really interesting. Somewhat perhaps with how many people were in that tribe, with the size of... Right. Yeah. It's interesting the way the tribes are laid out in their, in their numbering, from 33,000 through 72,000, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing there as uh, estimated numbers. But each tribe fits in a linear line between that, each one growing incrementally by probably five or six percent. And you have that in your website. And, and we, have, uh, we have that available in the Sinai and Arabia uh, DVD. That is okay. well explained, because it takes, it takes 
take some oh, yeah. time to, yeah. to be able to. So it's not necessarily available on your website as far as the the graph that you had last night? Right. No, but if you go okay. into numbers and you look at the number of each tribe, mm -hmm. the total, and then you put that in an Excel mm -hmm. spreadsheet as an example, just write the numbers down and then you do a quick graph, you'll see how the smallest uh, number to the largest l draws almost a straight line up. So if the smallest pillar was 14 inches, mm -hmm. Which, it was. The, which is mm -hmm. the smallest one yeah. that we found. Mm -hmm. And then you took that number at 32,000 and then Judah, the tribe, largest tribe at 72, and you calculated what size Judah's pillar would have mm -hmm. to be based on its number size. Mm -hmm. It's about 32 inches. So the pillars that are on the ground fit in this 14 yeah. to 32 inch yeah. range, <laughs> all of them being yeah. incrementally yeah. larger. Yeah. So it just, it's a, uh, another way to look at it to where most, because it specifically says that he had a pillar for each tribe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I've always wondered, well, how would it be unique? Mm -hmm. And then how do I explain what I see at the site? And you found where they were hewn out? You found that spot as well? We you can see the holes where they were taken it, out of? It, interesting story, um, and I, I'll just briefly, we, most of our uh, expeditions were between 1992 and 1999, during okay. that range. Mm -hmm. um, all of those trips, there was multiple agendas that we could possibly make, depending on whether we were successful in getting in the area, not getting arrested, mm -hmm. you know, and, and trying to do something. So I always had alternates. This quarry, or the top of this valley, was always one on the agenda, and we never made it. And I left in 1999, we left Arabia, and I was thinking, we'll never see that quarry firsthand. We'll never be able to get up there. And in 2003, Miracle of all miracles, miracle we got of all there. Miracle. We <laughs> were able to go we back to the kingdom <laughs> yep, and we were we able got there. To, we got there. <laughs> so yes, we were able to t photograph, take pictures of, and see exactly where the material came right. from. And there's no doubt yeah. about it. And there's no doubt. Were, we've had it analyzed. I mean, we have pieces from the quarry, we have pieces from the yeah. stones on the ground. We know they're the same. No and we know they came from there because still up in the quarry there are three that were marred right, and uh, in still, their production. Still yeah. So they're yeah, still up there. up there. And then you were in Horeb, Mount Horeb. You were there. You saw the cave where Elijah was? We saw the cave. I was able to, uh, on one trip, I was able to climb up um, and get into the cave. Is that really difficult? It, it, in a way, it is. Um, the valley floor is about 28 to 3,000 feet. In, in elevation above sea level. Um, we were able to go in later on and with, with GPS devices and I had an uh, altimeter and some other things. So we were measuring mm -hmm. um, elevations as best we could with the equipment that we what had. What were your thoughts on when you were in the cave? Well, and like I say, it was, it was a struggle to get up there, but I could, I could imagine, um, you know, my, in my mind, it was Elijah mm -hmm. and his uh, the story of Elijah um, escaping, going through the desert 40 days and, and arriving at the mountain, and I know this is the place that he was. I mean, to be there, just I'm sure to go to this place in the ancient times was as amazing and, and incredible as it was for us to re remember what happened at this location. God came down, formed a covenant with his people. So it's just a, an amazing place. And there it is, Elijah's in the cave, and these, um, you know, these events happen, uh, the earthquake and the fire passing by and this, this type of thing. And I'm, I'm puzzled and wondering, well, wishing that I would hear that still small voice as well. <laughs> nah, and it gives me chills to think about it, you know, but I, 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 it's, it's, it's about 20 feet deep. I said to myself, we could actually bring our tent, camp out in this cave mm -hmm. as a, as a oh, yeah. adventure, yeah. you know, yeah. and, uh, and, and yeah, it would be amazing. What about to do the that. idea of the winds uh, broke the rocks and the earth shook and, and, and this kind of thing that the Bible speaks about? Did you see any evidence of any of that? Besides, perhaps incredibly the one in the picture here. Well, yeah, yeah <laughs> in, incredibly. I was out there on one morning. Uh, uh, we were we had uh, uh, another young man and myself had gone on a trip, and we were there looking in some caves. And in that morning, we got up, and I had my video camera in my hand, and I had videoed the sunrise. We were just watching it come up like this, and I had just turned it off. I'm just seconds, and I turned around to him, and we heard in the distance a 
like a um, F-16 coming through the valley during the Gulf War, where they were mm -hmm. fly real low. So we knew, I knew that 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 roar sound. Mm -hmm. But what it it was coming, we could we could we could hear it, and we're looking at each other, and then all of a sudden the ground just started moving. I mean, up and down. We were thrown literally in the air, and it was a wave of an earthquake coming really? through. So you were in a cave. Uh, well, no, we were we were actually standing. Like I say, I just finished video in the yeah. sunrise, so we were standing in an open area. But we expected fully that where we had camped, which was right on the edge of a uh, cliff there, mm -hmm. was going to slide right off and that rocks would come tumbling down on us. Yeah. So I have been out there during, and, and it is the noise that it makes. Mm -hmm. and, and I had a, um, a geologist tell me at, at some time, he said, when you're in an area that is, that is um, s completely purged of topsoil, mm -hmm. so you're looking at raw granite. Okay. If that would have uh, happened at night, yeah. Yeah. he said you would have seen red and green lights as the rocks Static. moved from the uh, effect of the, uh, uh, of the rocks grinding, yeah. the piezo effect, yeah. or piezo effect of uh, wow. generating light from Rome, just like this technology wow. of an LED. <laughs> He said, you would have seen it, it has been, been an incredible experience at night, but it was incredible enough. We were both sitting there shaking wow. yeah. and, and uh, I... And the split drop, that's <laughs> supposedly where the water came out of. Is there evidence that you could think of or see or sense or touch or, or maybe a ravine or something that goes away from it? Is there really evidence to that? Is it speculation or is it very obvious? Uh, no, there's real evidence there. Really? there. There's evidence that water came out of it. That, that's, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that there is a crack in the bottom that uh, at the base that is filled with uh, granite debris and rocks now. That if you dug down, you would find a pathway. Mm -hmm. uh, as you're climbing up, the split rock sits on a pile of boulders about five feet in elevation, 500 feet in elevation, okay. 500 feet. Mm -hmm. So to work your way up there, you're basically working your way up through what I call little channels or waterfalls where water was mm -hmm. coming out of the split and it had washed. So when you get up to the rock, you can see these channels are clearly cut out. We show that in our presentation. You'll, you'll see water erosion on the granite where the rock would have split and that water comes gushing. It took a lot of force to do this, to actually cut these channels out. And then you see the evidence of it as it goes down the hill. And I have, uh, within a mile of this area, there was another area where I know that there was a waterfall in ancient history at the ancient time. And, um, and that you can see how it cut through the channel and, and what it did to the rock. Mm -hmm. So it cannot be wind erosion, that is the point of that. Yeah. yeah, you see it elsewhere, you can see the type of erosion pattern that it is, so it's definitely. And I believe and, and, that. And, and archeologists have said okay, that, yeah. that, it, that just the stone itself from a distance when you're looking at it would draw attention he, um, and we'll cover this in our presentation, but that, that, that is a place that you would go to look um, as, as something that would have been special. Yeah, know, it drew ancient. us directly. It, drew us. it, it yeah. drew us directly to it. it. Anomaly in the landscape. What's yeah. that? You knew about it. You knew that we didn't. It, there was... Oh, no, 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 no. We were lost. We no, were, this, it was April oh, yeah, the 2nd of 1992. We were lost. We thought we were going to come in to the backside of the range and climb over the mountain and come down inside the fenced area. Mm -hmm. We were very far off wow. from what we thought we were. Yeah. This is again one of those things where you think all is gone wrong, but you're really on the right track. Mm -hmm. Your feet are going where God wants Praise you God. to go. Turned our face, Turned our face to this toward rock. this yeah. big rock just hmm. sitting there you in never the heard landscape. About it. No, Was it ever all. discovered before no. or written about? No. no. So I you were the original found... discoverers of yes. this yeah. rock. Yes. yes. Oh, Absolutely. isn't that isn't that powerful? Um, it is. This is our wow. ministry. This is yeah. this is yeah. uh, the namesake of and, our ministry. And the other thing too, it, and I want to uh, don't want to extend this too much longer here, but I do want to say this: that there's people that are watching, I'm sure, that would say, "Yeah, they're just doing this for money." I would like to say this: that they came to our church. That's why they're here. They came to our church, no charge except for the airline ticket and the hotel and the rental car. That's it. They're, they don't want any money. Uh, they'll take free will offering, of course, but this is not, they're not doing it for money. Jim has a regular job. I do. Works uh, every day. 
Uh, uh, yeah. I work a minimum 40 hour week. I'm on call 24 yeah. seven. I work so for a utility company. So it's not based on that, like a lot of people say. <laughs> you know, right. people will say that. About the They're money. doing it for right. the money. Nope. It's because God is using you in this area and you're wanting to take that word out and show it to people. Now, I don't believe it's, it's necessarily even your desire. It is your desire, but God's behind it. Because there's something going to explode that I believe that it's going to explode when this all comes out. And I would also like to say, and I know that you're not saying this. I've never been to Saudi Arabia, but I know that I'm saying this, that I believe the time will come where when Israel will discover some of those things that you have discovered back in there, if they don't already know. But uh, perhaps some of that land might be... Uh, taken back to the original promise of the children that this tribe is belongs here, this land belongs to this tribe. Yes. And I'm thinking the way I understand this is this territory belonged to a tribe. Mm. What was the name of that tribe? Do you know offhand? This territory originally, uh, mm -hmm. the land of promise of Abraham, mm -hmm. and then on passed on down uh, to the tribes as they divided the land. You don't know which specific son this belonged to. I, I've got a theory, but okay. I would I, I would say yeah, and, and we go through this in our presentation mm -hmm. as well. But the this there's there's twelve tribes, mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. land was divided up, mm -hmm. and so as a result of the years of research, the work in Arabia, we crisscross mm -hmm. the country from mm -hmm. one end to the other. The only place we haven't traveled into directly is Yemen. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and we see evidence of the tribes on ancient maps all the way down to Yemen and Oman. Mm -hmm. The tribe of Gad, mm -hmm. as an example, mm -hmm. the people of Gad. Those names appear uh, pottery, in ancient maps. And you find pottery shreds and, and all tons of like evidence. Yeah, like I say, in dig your finger Arrowhead. in the sand out there, you're going to find an artifact. Grinding stones. Yeah. I will say this, though, too. In uh, Muslim history, of the Arabian Peninsula. Exactly. In their own history, mm -hmm. uh, they record that Moses and the children of Israel, they say, in their history, made the pilgrimage to Mecca. They have record of their own that mm -hmm. says that Moses and the children of Israel were on the Arabian mm -hmm. Peninsula. But not only that, of course, they call uh, him Ibrahim. But they also okay. call Ibrahim their father, mm -hmm. not through Isaac, but through Ishmael. Mm -hmm. And they will tell you in their own history that their father, Ibrahim, walked all around the Arabian Peninsula. The whole Peninsula. Arabian Peninsula. Yes. So it, you see that you can see went. there God are promises. certain yeah. parallels that are very, very intriguing, to mm -hmm. say the least. Very, so, yeah. very intriguing, to say the least. may be different, but, but I fully believe that they're exactly right that Moses and the Israelites passed right by mm -hmm. this place, this, this where, the, where Mecca is. They went right through that area, but they were on their way into the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Arabia. And you have the evidence. You oh. saw the evidence. Oh. We have and you touched the evidence. The evidence. We have touched and you the have evidence. the pictures of the evidence. Absolutely. And the video of and the evidence. evidence. <laughs> For more information, it is your website is Split Rock Research Foundation? Is it what? What is it? Dot com. Uh, it's www.splitrockresearch.org. Okay. Split Rock Research. And you can Google Jim and Penny, yeah. um, Mount Sinai, these types of things. Oh. You'll come right to it. Yeah, yeah they're all this, this is so exciting. <laughs> Pray, yeah. Praise yeah. God that that and what I'm so humbled by is that how God used you in that specific. Mm -hmm parameter of his mm -hmm. of his of of time we live in an era right. this is our time right. yeah we were blessed we were really yes. blessed Obviously to be able so. to see these yeah. things and you know and it needs to come out now we're in that yeah. time where yeah. I, believe I believe it needs so. to be revealed and, and that's why he took you there an encouragement <laughs> for all who may be listening to this as well would be uh, let me make something very plain Jim and I are very ordinary people. We are not, uh, the whole idea of this Indiana Jones uh, mm -hmm. moniker Persona. is uh, disgusting to me. Mm -hmm. I, that is not who we are. Mm -hmm. We are, we are very, mm -hmm. we're, we're a family of 
you know, granted we may be a little on the cuckoo side in some of the things that we have done before, <laughs> but, but, um, you know, we're, we're, uh, uh, we're very, very normal in our day to day. He works a job every day. I take care of a home every day. I, I take care of all the business for Split Rock Research. Uh, single-handedly. I mean, this is just who we are. Yeah. We're just regular people, Amen. but we do not serve a regular God. Amen. He Amen. is the one who is extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. And these things that are in Arabia, um, I specifically titled our, the book of our testimony of this story, which is the God of the mountain. Yeah. I specifically titled it that because uh, this is not about the mountain of God. It is about the God of the mountain. Yes. Every bit of this is a, a grace of God revealing Himself in this day and time. And I would tell you, if you, uh, you know, if, if you have a feeling of, well, I'm just an ordinary person, Jim and I are just ordinary people, mm -hmm. but somewhere around you, there are all sorts of things that God wants Opportunity. done. Yeah. And if yeah. you just listen Amen. for that still small yeah. voice, Amen. He will use you in your area mm. for what He wants done. Yeah. And that's the beauty of the whole thing. He does not elevate Jim or I mm. above anyone. Right. We are all His children, and every one of us can do great exploits mm -hmm. for Him if we Again, just listen for Him. He turns your face where He wants your exactly. face. Exactly. <laughs> that is precise yes. and perfect. Thank you so much.